Good evening, colleagues, and thank you very much for joining us tonight in this series of webinars in collaboration with SADA and the PSSA, the Pedo Society of South Africa, as we are observing Children's Oral Health Month. We do have an exciting lineup today, uh, but before we go into everything, let's just go through the house rules for the day. Please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab. CPD certificates will be loaded on the SADA platform, and you will be able to access all your certificates under member profile. And if you are not a SADA member, you will be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one clinical CEU. I will now introduce our speaker. And um, I must say, I am very excited to be going through this um, webinar today as it's very important. I've got Dr. Anel Fansel, and I will re be reading her bio. So Dr. Anel Fanzel is a pediatric oncologist and the current acting clinical head of the Tigerberg Hospital Pediatric Oncology Unit. She is also a senior lecturer at the Stellenbosch University since 2008. Dr. Fanzel is currently working on her PhD about the late effects of childhood cancer survivors in South Africa. And she is also involved in several other national and international research projects. She has a keen interest in bleeding disorders and has been a member of Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee of the South African Hemophilia Foundation and served as a chairperson from 2020 to 2021. Dr. Anel Fanzel, I am quite thrilled um, to be introducing you as our guest speaker today when you are going to embark on our topic, management of patients with hemophilia. I'm not sure how it is there in um, Cape Town, but it's quite rainy here in Joburg. Um, so yeah, we are looking forward to hearing um, your topic today. Over to you, Dr. Fanzel. Thank you very much. Tepiso for that kind introduction. For a change, we've got summer in Cape Town, so it's your turn to, to have winter. <laughs> I guess, I guess. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Can I just confirm that you can see the slide? Yes, all clear from my side and hoping for all the right. rest. Okay. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you very much to Sada for the invitation to speak to you tonight about the royal disease, hemophilia. Um, I will enlighten you as to why it's called the royal disease in the talk. Uh, it will be a medical talk. And this, just a disclaimer, I'm obviously not a dentist, so you will know much more about the procedures, but I can tell you all about hemophilia and what your role should be. You might also get a little bit of a history lesson in this session. So let's get going. Okay, slide is not advancing, so I'm just going to share again on this one and then it should work. Yeah, so do you see the first slide? Yes, we can see. Okay, we great. Can see the first slide. So some of you might remember this very daunting looking clotting cascade that you see on your right hand side. Um, that's um, the clotting cascade that involves kind of the domino action of the one clotting factor activating the other one. And I have circled factors eight and nine in that clotting cascade for you. And they are the ones that patients with hemophilia have a deficiency of. So what is hemophilia? It is uh, an inherited and lifelong 
single clotting factor deficiency, which then leads to bleeding episodes. And you know that patients are also known as so-called bleeders. It is indeed a very rare disorder. Uh, and you can see the incidence of hemophilia A, which is the most common one, as 17 per 100,000 males. Um, I said it was an inherited disorder. So what is the mode of inheritance? It's X-linked and it's autosomal recessive. So that means that males are almost exclusively if affected and females are usually carriers. Of course, there are some exceptions. Um, for instance, in South Africa, we have about five or six females with hemophilia um, because of some underlying genetic problem that they also have. So you can see at the pictures there on your left hand side, the red picture, that is when the mother is a carrier of the hemophilia gene. So only one of her exes um, carry the hemophilia gene. And in her children, if she has a son, he can only um, he can inherit either the X with the gene or not. So her son has a 50% chance of being affected, and her daughters have a 50% chance of also being a carrier. On the other hand, if the father has affected is affected with hemophilia and the mother is normal then none of his sons will inherit the hemophilia gene as it is carried on the X chromosome, but his females will all be, after his girls will all be carriers. Sometimes we also see families where there's a spontaneous mutation. So then there's absolutely no family history or warning. Um, and sometimes even the families where there are hemophilia affected members don't disclose to the rest of the family, um, and then people do not know that their children might actually be affected. There are three different types of hemophilia, of which hemophilia A is the most common by far, about 85% of cases, and that's when you have a factor eight deficiency. I always tell the medical students, if you know alliteration, it's easy because hemophilia A is factor eight deficiency, although you don't spell it with an A. And then the second most common type is hemophilia B, which is 13% of cases. That's when you have a factor nine deficiency. It's also known as Christmas disease. It's got nothing to do with the religious holiday, but you can see there a patient called Stephen Christmas, who was the first patient ever to be diagnosed with hemophilia B in 1949. And then the rare third type is hemophilia C, where there's a factor 11 deficiency. So why is it called the royal disease? On the top right hand side, you can see a picture of Queen Victoria and some of her children. And she circled there in this family tree of the uh, royal family of the whole of Europe in green. Um, the Spanish family is there and the English family that we know today. And all the red squares are affected males. So they didn't know back then that um, these affected members had hemophilia. They only knew that they were bleeding and that they were dying. So if you focus on this family in the middle, I know you can see on the screen probably, but that's the famous Russian family of Tsar Nicholas II. And this is where your history lesson is going to come in. And it's because of this family that they discovered what this bleeding disease was that affected the royal family. So hemophilia actually sparked the Russian revolution or helped to spark it. You've all heard of Gregory Rasputin. He was a Russian peasant and a so-called faith healer. And he really just looked like a regular scaly guy to me. And he was a very good friend of the family of Tsar Nicholas II. And he also became the faith healer to Tsar Nicholas II's son, Alexei, who was suffering a lot from bleeding. And of course, they didn't know that he had hemophilia. So, this Gregory Rasputin formed a very, very close relationship with Alexandra the Tsarina. 
and people did not like and did not trust this very close relationship. So Rasputin became one of the most hated people in Russia. And along with some other events, of course, this sparked the Russian Revolution. So this family that I showed you, you may know that they were all murdered in 1918. And then um, 60 years later, their grave site was discovered. And people identified the family using DNA analysis. And then someone took the opportunity to also test and see whether the family had hemophilia. And they found that it was hemophilia B. So just to show you again that family. And for interest's sake, circled now in green is the English royal family, um, Charles and Harry and all the rest of them. So you can see how close they were to also being affected with hemophilia. So now we get to the clinical stuff. The history lesson is now done. Um, what is the bleeding pattern uh, in patients with hemophilia? So the hallmark is that they have bleeding into their joints and into their muscles. That's the absolute classical clinical feature. They also can have other types of bleeding that would be um, bleeding from the mouth or the nose. We see that quite frequently. Um, of course, excessive bruising. Um, they may have hematuria, blood in the urine, or um, excessive bleeding after procedures or minor trauma, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes there can be a history of affected family member if they are aware of the rest. Um, and sometimes parents have been accused of um, child abuse because of this clinical picture. So how do we make the diagnosis? We of course get this um, history that's suspicious of a bleeding disorder. Um, and as said before, it is usually 99.99% a boy. Um, and maybe there's a family history. We do some blood tests that will show us that the clotting profile is abnormal. Um, and we will then proceed to do a factor eight level to see if that is low. In that case, we diagnose hemophilia A. Um, if the hemo uh, factor eight level is normal, we will go ahead and test the factor nine level and then go on to diagnose hemophilia B. So it is a pretty easy diagnosis. We classify the severity of the disease according to the factor level in the blood, which is measured in percentage. So severe has a level of less than 1%, moderate 1 to 5%, and mild um, 5 to 40%. Normal is 50 to 150%. So severe patients normally have to present because they have regular bleeding episodes and they will bleed after procedures. Um, and it can be spontaneous bleeds and also after minor trauma. So they normally present quite early in life when the children start getting mobile and when they start falling, etc. Um, the moderate ones have less frequent bleeding episodes, and they usually only present after trauma or procedure. And the mild patients, they are usually, I think, your headaches, because many of them are undiagnosed. They bleed very occasionally, and um, I, we know that most of them are undiagnosed in South Africa, and they will only present when they start bleeding after a procedure. We also classify the bleeding episodes into minor and major um, bleeding events. The minor ones is when they have mouth or gum bleeds, epistaxis, hematuria, hematomas, or then early hemarthrosis, which is bleeding into the joints. And most often they have bleeding into the knees, elbows, and ankles. The major bleeds are life-threatening and be, uh, persons with hemophilia still die of these bleeds if they're not treated early enough and appropriately. So the worst one is the intracranial bleeds, and that's why we teach them that headache is a very serious symptom and must be treated. Um, of course, neck or airway bleeds, um, hip or iliopsoas muscle bleeds, the forearm because it can cause compartment syndrome and serious um, com complications gastrointestinal bleeds, any major injury, or very severe hemothrosis. 
patients with hemophilia can, of course, develop complications. The first one that can happen is that they can develop the so-called target joint. That's when they have um, more than four bleeds in the same joint in six months' time. Blood in the joint is harmful to this um, synovium in the joint. So with repeated bleeds, the synovium becomes very thickened, very vascular, and can then start bleeding spontaneously. If this process is not stopped, then the bone also becomes affected, which is called hemophilic arthropathy. The second one, which is really the most dreaded complication for us, is the development of antibodies or inhibitors, as it is known, to the um, treatment product, the factor that we are treating the patients with. Um, so once they develop these antibodies or inhibitors, then the normal treatment does not work anymore. And then we have to switch to an alternative treatment called bypassing agents. It's very important for you to know that the development of inhibitors can happen at any stage of the patient's life. So you must never ever attempt an invasive procedure in a hemophilia patient if you do not know whether there are inhibitors present or not. The treatment principles are the so-called price principles. Um, any treatment must be instituted very early. Um, bleeds can be really sore, especially the joint bleeds, so pain relief is important, and they cannot have any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or aspirin because that might worsen the bleeding. The affected joint or limb must be rested. Um, we use ice packs, not really to stop the bleeding, but more for swelling and pain relief. Um, you can put on a compression bandage, and then the affected area must be elevated if possible. The definitive treatment is then that we replace the factor that is missing. So we raise the level of the factor eight or nine by giving the missing factor intravenously. And it's called factor replacement therapy. Um, patients are actually taught from a young age, from about six years of age, we start teaching them how to mix this um, factor. And um, when they're old enough to start actually administering it themselves, when they're young, we try to teach the parents how to do it at home. So that's called home therapy. Um, factor eight has a much shorter half-life um, than factor nine. So we have to give factor eight more often when we treat. So there's a few ways that one can use this replacement therapy. Um, and the first one and the gold standard is primary prophylaxis. So that's when you start at a very young age of one to two years after the first joint bleed, you start administering um, factor eight or nine regularly, once a week, twice a week, up to three times a week to prevent um, bleeding episodes. It is the best treatment option, but it's very expensive. 500 units of factor eight is 1,200 rand, and that's a dose for a very small child. Most developing countries cannot give primary prophylaxis, but in South Africa, we do. The second option is treatment on demand. So that's when they do not receive any prophylaxis, but you only treat the bleeds when they occur, which is not ideal. Secondary prophylaxis is when they not receiving prophylaxis, but they go through a difficult period of a lot of joint bleeds or a problematic joint, and then we can start um, prophylaxis for for that time. Okay, so um, the management of bleeding episodes when they occur, it's very important, as I've said, that all bleeding episodes should be treated as early as possible. So we do make a distinction between the treatment of major versus minor episodes, and obviously the doses are not important to you, um, but we do give higher doses for major bleeds or emergencies. We never ever do the factor level first um, to see what it is because it will always be low. And then we advise doctors to always contact the closest hemophilia treatment center. And for minor bleeds, it's the same treatment principles. We just give less of the factor eight or nine. The general management of a hemophilia patient is extremely important as it is a rare disease. Um, and you also know that um, 
often rare diseases, um, the knowledge of rare diseases is not um, very well widespread among healthcare professionals. So we teach the parents everything that they should know so that they can educate the, the doctors or the nurses. So we talk to the schools, make sure they are informed, um, advise that they cannot do any contact sports. You do not want the patient with hemophilia playing rugby, definitely not. Um, almost all of them want to play soccer uh, or cricket, and it's possible. Then we use um, uh, prophylaxis on the day before the game, um, administer it before the sport, and then they pretty much protect it um, for that game. Um, no walking rings for babies because they fall and they get head bleeds. Physiotherapy is very important to build up the muscles or rehabilitate. And genetic counseling, of course, um, because once there isn't one child identified, the parents want to know the risk. They must always wear a medic alert, but we always struggle with our patients because they come to clinic and you ask, where's the medic alert? And they say, it's at home. So um, it's also always an ongoing battle to convince them to, to wear it permanently. The team approach is very, very important. And you can see that the dentist is definitely part of the multidisciplinary team. Um, the physiotherapist, the orthopedic surgeon, the pediatrician, even a psychiatrist, a geneticist, and um, as necessary, other people as well. The medical management, um, there's quite a few things that we can also offer. I've already told you that there's some medicines that they must avoid, um, not to worsen bleeding episodes. Uh, we do give them immunizations um, because it's not an intramuscular injection, it's much more superficial, so we don't normally see bleeds on that um, day. And yes, they can have COVID vaccination. Um, in mild hemophilia A, where there's only a mild reduction in the factor VIII level, we can use a drug called vasopressin, um, intranasally actually, that can release some of the factor VIII stores that's still there and can help um, reduce the number of bleeds. Very importantly for you as well is the use of tranexamic acid, um, trade name cyclocapron, which is an antifibrinolytic drug. So it stops the breakdown of the blood clots, as I'm sure you know. Um, and this is a very important tool in the treatment of um, mouth bleeds, epistaxis, and also um, used after dental procedures. Um, cure, people have been talking, it, well, talking about it for a very long time, and there is an option on the table uh, with gene therapy. There have been some trials going on for more than 10 years. And there have been some successes where they um, effectively made severe patients moderate patients, which is a, a very big change in that patient's life, but it's still considered experimental. Surgical management, it's um, of course very, very important before and after any invasive procedure that um, the patients must have factor replacement. Factor eight specifically also has a role to play in wound healing. So that's another uh, reason why they must have it um, post-op to ensure wound healing and closure so that they don't bleed. When they develop target joints, we can also use yttrium synovectomy, which is a chemical destruction of the thickened synovium and that reduces bleeding episodes. And of course, they might need lots of other orthopedic procedures if there were abnormalities in the joints. All of these procedures, the surgeries, um, it's better to be done in a tertiary center where there's experience with the management of hemophilia patients. So when do we suspect the dreaded inhibitor formation? That's when you are treating a patient for a bleed, but they are not responding as you had hoped. The pain is not lessened, the swelling doesn't reduce. Uh, which usually happens within a few hours, or they're not yeah, responding at all. Um, we normally also monitor them every six to 12 months. We draw um, blood to test for in the inhibitor level. So who can get um, inhibitors? Any patient, um, and it's up to a third of all patients. 
There are some risk factors such as a family history of bleeding disorders or African descent that um, might have higher risk. And if you are in KwaZulu-Natal, that is the province in South Africa that has the highest um, incidence of inhibitors in hemophilia patients. So when do they usually develop it? Within a few months after actually starting to receive the factory placement, and that's from less than 20 exposure days. But what do we do if uh, they do develop inhibitors? We classify them as high or low responders based on the level of the inhibitors or the antibodies in the blood. We measure it in the tester units. The low responders have less than five tester units. And in them, we can still get away with um, giving double or even three times the usual dose of the factor eight or nine replacement, but we have to monitor and see if they do respond. The high responders have a higher level and in them we need to use the so-called bypassing agents. So what are the bypassing agents? They work in a completely different way. I won't bore you with the clotting cascade again to show you where they come in. Uh, we have two available. One is activated factor seven and the other one is factor eight inhibitor bypassing agent or FIBA. They are both extremely expensive. One dose for a child can easily be 13,000 Rand up to 25,000 Rand. It's only available in the tertiary centers in the public sector um, and only um, tertiary academic hospitals have access and manage these patients. The last complication just to know about is that they have a risk of transmission of infections because most of the um, products that we use, the treatment products are blood derived. You may remember in the 80s, in the HIV pandemic, when that first hit, there were many um, patients with hemophilia who contracted HIV and there was a class action on behalf of them as well. The risk these days, however, is very small because all the blood product um, treatments that they receive are um, treated and virally inactivated. So we are not aware of any transmission of infections, at least in the last 15 years. Okay, now we come to the section that you will be more interested in, and that's the dental care and management. So very, very important is good oral hygiene. It's essential and it can prevent so many problems. And I don't have to tell you how um, poor oral hygiene is out there. I think when I find a child in my clinic that tells me they brush their teeth twice a day, I think I want to give them a medal because often it's only once a day. Um, they, of course, have to minimize sticky sweets. Mm, good luck with that. Um, patients with hemophilia are more susceptible to periodontal disease because often they may be brushing less because they have bleeds. And you know, it's a vicious circle. The less you brush, then the more disease you get and the more predisposed you are to bleeding. Regular dental visits are very, very important, of course. And when you see a patient with a bleeding disorder, doesn't need to be only hemophilia, um, you can um, consider the use of sealants to try and prevent the development of cavities because once you have to do dental work, it becomes a completely different ball game, as you will see. It's good to do an orthodontic assessment when they are young teens because um, there can be problems associated with overcrowding that can lead to periodontal disease. And then of course, when you have a patient with hemophilia or maybe you're involved in a, a treatment center, you work with hemophilia treaters, having really close liaison is, is very important to plan and manage. So what should be done before the procedure? It is crucial to plan invasive procedures really carefully, especially for patients with inhibitors. Sometimes putting things in place for the patients will take a while um, and 
to notify someone on the morning that later that day you will be treating a hemophilia patient is a little bit short notice. So it's advised to really consult your closest hemophilia treater or team well in advance when you are planning a procedure for a patient with hemophilia or any patient with any bleeding disorder. So there are a few things that need to be discussed. Um, the extent of the procedure will determine uh, how long we think the patient would need factor replacement for afterwards. Um, should we be doing levels afterwards? And just so that we know what to expect, what is the bleeding risk after the procedure. We would normally make sure that the patient's um, hemoglobin level is adequate, especially if you're planning sedation for the child. Some of them have iron deficiency anemia because of the regular bleeding events. And then, of course, the inhibitor level is the most important. So an inhibitor level is not a test that takes 30 minutes. It takes a couple of hours. Um, and in the public sector, often you wait for a couple of days to have that result. So that is definitely why you need to um, contact the team well in advance so that um, everything can be arranged. Um, the hemophilia team will then manage and advise um, the factor replacement that the um, person must get before the procedure and also after. Um, they must receive the factor replacement 30 minutes, about 30 minutes before you actually start with the procedure. Um, so if you are in an academic center, it should be pretty easy because then the patient can just move, go to the ward, the hematology ward or the pediatric oncology ward, wherever, um, receive the factor and then move over to you. Um, but if you're in a different building from the hemophilia treatment center, there's some logistics that will need to be sorted. Um, if the procedure is really extensive, um, then we may choose to monitor factor eight levels afterwards so that we can just see that we are providing adequate treatment and cover. So when is factor replacement indicated? When you are considering procedures, and the easy answer is almost always. Um, local anesthesia under factor cover is definitely safe for hemophilia patients. And you may find that uh, hemophilia patients, once, they, once they've had their factor replacement and you do a procedure, that they actually bleed less than um, other patients with the same procedure. So for infiltration, for intrapapillary and intraligamentary injections, um, factor cover um, makes it safe. It's also required after um, certain blocks or even lingual infiltration if it's necessary. So basically any invasive procedure that involves a needle or anything like that will need factor cover. The only time that they will not actually need that is if they're only going for an oral hygiene visit and um, a cleaning of the teeth, unless there's really serious gingivitis and you expect a lot of bleeding, then it would be um, better to, to have the factor before. During the procedure, um, and these are guidelines um, that's published, I will give you two references at the end. Um, it's obviously to use as gentle technique as you can to try and minimize any trauma and to definitely make use of local hemostatic measures. That's very, very important in the management of a hemophilia patient. Um, of course, you, I would imagine, you always use resorbable sutures and to place the sutures very carefully so um, that it can help to prevent bleeding. Surgical stents may also be used. We have found that Surgicel has been really um, helpful in preventing bleeds. And even when there's some bleeding afterwards, a bit of um, Surgicel can do the trick. 
And then according to the published literature, endodontic therapy is preferred over extraction. Um, I'm not even sure what that is because I'm pretty sure we don't have access to that. So we are very used to managing patients with um, tooth extractions. Oral antibiotics, that's only necessary if you think it's clinically indicated um, because pa patients with hemophilia do not have an increased risk for infection. After the procedure, it's really obvious that one has to monitor for blood loss that's more than expected. Um, and again, if you discuss the procedure and it's only one tooth extraction, we may actually let them go home. But if it's more extensive, we might choose to admit them overnight just to observe for any bleeding. Tranexamic acid, as I've mentioned, is um, very, very helpful and very effective after dental procedures. Um, I normally ask them to start it the night before the procedure, and then they carry on for three to seven days, depending on the extent of the procedure. Um, some patients, however, again, depending on the extent of the procedure and what was done, may need factor replacement as well, in addition to the tranexamic acid. We normally give it daily. Um, one can give it um, BD as well, 12 hourly, but for dental procedures, we normally give it daily for a few days and the number of days we will determine um, based on um, the expected bleeding risk. So there's some do's and don'ts that you know better than I, and that's to avoid hot foods and drinks until normal sensation has returned. And obviously we advise them not to eat chips and fizzers um, after the procedure for at least a week. Um, your older patients must avoid smoking um, and then you can have them rinse uh, with salt water mouthwashes or Andalex or whatever it is um, for five to seven days, only starting the day after, because otherwise if they start swishing around on the first day, they might dislodge the clot. When they go home, they must obviously inform you if there is any bleeding that happens at home. And most often the patients will come back to us, obviously. Um, and then we will um, phone the dentist. Um, and usually we can stop the bleeding with local measures. Like I said, a bit of surgery cell or maybe another stitch if needed. Um, and factor eight as well or nine. Um, and then appropriate analgesia, as mentioned before, not the non-steroidals or the aspirin. If any bleeding then occurs, um, I've already mentioned what we will do. And specifically, um, one can then use the fibrin glue and the um, cellulose, as mentioned. Okay, so um, there is an organization called the South African Hemophilia Foundation. It's a very active foundation, patient-driven. Um, they have a national hemophilia or bleeding disorders registry. It's now web-based. Uh, we have about 400 known patients in the Western Cape, and there's about three and a half thousand in the country. But as said before, there are many, many who are undiagnosed and still out there. Um, there's a very strong focus on increasing the awareness and trying to increase the diagnosis and they support the patients and the treaters and lobby for adequate treatment for all. Um, we are always looking for people to join the foundation. Um, and I was chair of the Medical and Advisory Scientific um, Council for this foundation. So if you are interested in joining, you um, can contact me afterwards. I'm sure so I can give you my contact details. So there are some resources. Um, the World Federation of Hemophilia is the overarching body, international body, um, and I've given you the web address there. There's very nice resources, um, free educational resources on there. Um, also the Hemophilia Guidelines, which was, I think, updated in 2020. Um, I've given you the two um, references there. Um, there's actually a whole medical journal just dedicated to hemophilia. 
And there's a World Congress every two years, uh, which has more than 5,000 participants. It's really a big Congress. And the next one is happening this May in Montreal in Canada. All right. Um, so I'm just going to leave that slide there. And that's the end of my talk. And I welcome any questions. Thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Fanzel, for the lovely um, talk. It was quite insightful. Thank you so much for taking us through this royal disease educational journey. It, it has been very, very um, insightful, as I said, and quite brilliant. Um, and I'm sure our colleagues also appreciated the history lessons um, behind that in the beginning. Um, you have certainly given us a much better understanding of how we manage our hemophilia patients. And if we know now better, we will do better next time. So we will go sorry. through- the, Jippy, so the sorry, I, I forgot to mention something. Um, okay. I mentioned patients with inhibitors are really difficult to manage. Um, so I would advise that those patients, if they have dental procedures, that it's best to refer them to the tertiary academic centers um, because they can be really tricky and really difficult to control the bleeding. But patients, um, other patients with hemophilia can be managed elsewhere, provided that you, you talk to the um, hemophilia treatment center. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Anel. I will go actually straight through the um, Q&A. And I guess our first question speaks to that. It says, what is the contact number for the hemophilia treatment center? You have mentioned the academic tertiary um, institution. I'm not sure if you would want to elaborate on that one, um, Anel. Yeah, so throughout the country, in all the major centers, there are hemophilia treatment centers in basically all the academic hospitals that's um, real, um, you know, tagged onto a, a university. Um, and I can actually supply SADA with our um, latest little guideline book because normally all our numbers, all the hemophilia treatment centers, landlines, and some of the treater cell phone numbers are in there. And you will definitely find your closest um, treatment center in that list. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next one is, is it possible that Dr. Fanzel could quickly discuss some of the drugs being used by cardiologists to inhibit clotting? My cardiologists mm. to inhibit clotting. That's an interesting question, and I must say, really off topic. Um, I wonder um, if they are just referring to warfarin I, and heparin. I presume so. Mm. Um, in that case, if you are, have a patient where um, who's on warfarin, and that's a lot of older people. Um, normally, you have to stop the warfarin um, on day six before the procedure. And then the patient will have to have a blood test before the procedure also to see that their blood clotting has now returned to normal before you proceed. Otherwise, you will be faced with uh, bleeding. And then the warfarin may be restarted the day after. Um, if it's a patient on heparin that they inject themselves called clexane, then they normally have to stop um, the evening before. So that's much easier to manage. Um, but I would suggest anyone who's on anticoagulation that you definitely liaise with the cardiologist or the in, um, physician who's involved so that you can just agree and make sure that the patient is following um, the guidelines of stopping so that you don't run into trouble with bleeding. And the next question, what would you recommend for a dentist in private to manage a hemophilia of von Villebrand's patient before multiple extractions? Yeah, so the very first step is that you must phone the referring doctor, 
who will often be the hemophilia treater um, so that you can discuss, as I said, firstly, what kind of procedure are you planning? Will it be something really minor or will it actually be major and involve quite a few extractions and have a high bleeding risk? And then you can discuss what needs to be practically done, where must the patient go for the factory placement before and after, um, how is it going to work because you have like, you need to give the 30 minutes before you start the procedure. So where is that going to happen and how? And just discuss all those logistics. So you have to make sure the hemophilia treater is on board. And as long as that happens and the patient does get the factory placement, everything should run smoothly. Um, we do sometimes get breakthrough bleeding afterwards, but it's in the minority of cases. And as said before, um, the, it's quite quickly solved with local treatment and factor replacement. And you shouldn't have, if the patient received the factor before, 30 minutes before, and the patient does not have inhibitors, you must also check that the um, physician is checking for that before you do the procedure. Then there shouldn't be any bleeding while you do the procedure. Okay, the next question, quite interesting. Which of the COVID vaccines would you recommend that will not form blood clots? <laughs> okay, yeah, so I should have expected that question. <laughs> Our hemophilia community was quite worried um, about that, um, um, you know, the formation of thrombosis, especially if they got COVID. So all in all, patients with bleeding disorders and hemophilia are not actually expected to form clots if they get COVID um, because their bleeding disorder is kind of protective. And also they're not considered to be a higher risk for thrombotic events to the best of my knowledge. So we do not advise any specific COVID vaccine. Um, we advocate the one that's available to them is, would be safe. And we've definitely advised all our patients to, to get it. And we have not had any serious adverse event amongst our patients to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you for that, Anel. Um, there's also a big interest in joining the Hemophilia Foundation. So um, we will share your details with the delegates later on, Anel. Um, a colleague, Mariki Weekly, wants to join um, the foundation. So we will send through um, your details. And we Hi. have another question here. Would you advise crushed powdered transect? Examic acid directly onto the bleeding site in the mouth. Um, the doctor says, I have read about it years ago and wondered if this is still a possible alternative to Sergicel or even effective. Um, yes, people have used it. They've also, I think, made mouthwashes with the cyclocapron and one can do that. That is, um, can be effective. Um, but I think instead of crushing the cyclocapron, um, drinking it actually and applying local measures like fibrin glue or um, surgery cell, the combination would actually work the best. And we do have those available widely. Okay, so that follows on to the next question um, from a colleague says, does transaxamic acid need a prescription to obtain? Yes, it does need a prescription. Okay, all right. Um, we've got quite a lot of interest here um, and now, so bear with us with the questions. Um, it's quite a very interesting um, topic. So another question here is, is it safe for the dentist to prescribe desmopressin with recommendation from the hemophilia department or doctor? Okay, it's a very good question. The answer is no. Um, so desmopressin uh, is something that we can try in patients with mild hemophilia A. Only the ones with mild hemophilia A, it will really have a chance to be effective. The ones with severe hemophilia A, the levels are just too low. So you, you wouldn't be effect effective. Um, it's also not guaranteed to work. 
So if we're considering that in a patient with mild hemophilia A, we will do a trial. So we will admit them, um, measure their blood levels, give the DDAVP or vasopressin, and then measure blood levels again. And then we would be able to see if this is effective for the patient or not. Only in the patients who that is effective for may it be on consideration to also incorporate into the management um, of minor procedures. Okay, great. I think we've come to the end of our Q&A. And I'd just like to thank you once again, um, Anel, for just um, simplifying this complex and extensive topic. So thank you very much for, for your talk. It was very, very, very brilliant. So thank you very much. We're hoping to have more people joining the Hemophilia Foundation to help um, out in the country. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. It has been a pleasure. Thank you again for the opportunity. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope everyone else as well. And I'm very um, happy to hear that there's interest in, in joining MASAC um, of the SHF. As far as I know, we do not have any dentists who are members. Um, so that will be really, really great. Um, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Yes, we do look forward to joining the foundation and we look forward to our colleagues sending the details to join in the foundation. So we will be in contact with SADA and the PSSA in um, gathering the names to join the foundation. Thank you once again. Sure. Um, colleagues, before we um, adjourn this meeting, I just have a few um, announcements to make in terms of the upcoming events. On the 10th of February, we've got the Sada and Henry Shine Dental Warehouse um, webinar series on tooth whitening and aesthetic dentistry with Dr. Mark Bose. On the 15th of February, we've got another collaboration with Sada and the Pedodontic Society of South Africa. We will be discussing preformed space maintainers with our international speaker, Dr. Mukul Jain. And then finally in Feb, we'll have on the 16th, a big one. There will be a Sada Gala Awards evening, recognizing your peers in the industry. So we are looking forward to those particular webinars. I'd also like to announce that if anybody is interested in joining the Pedodontic Society of South Africa, please head over to our website, um, www.pedodonticsocietyofsouthafrica.co.za. We are also available on various social media platforms. You can visit our Facebook page, Pedodontic Society of South Africa, and also our Instagram page, Pedodontic Society of South Africa, um, on there as well. So thank you very much, colleagues, for joining us this evening. We have come to the end of this interesting um, talk today. We will certainly manage hemophilia patients much better. Thank you very much, Dr. Fanzel. Pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, ladies. We will end the session now. Good night. <laughs>